something together can be a really satisfying experience whether it's a recipe, a tool shed or of course your very own PC. But ordering parts from a favorite website and slotting them together is really as far as most people go. I mean you can't exactly be a CPU from scratch, can you? Well, you can't. But fortunately, companies like Kenton and TSMC do it every day. But how? Believe it or not, the main ingredient in that fancy Core i7 sitting in a rig or that Snapdragon sitting in your smartphone is sand. I mean, it isn't exactly the same stuff that you'd find at a beach. It's specially mined in order to be more pure than what you'd make a sand castle out of. And the sand is heated to thousands of degrees and is chemically purified to produce a virtually flawless cylinder of silicon. Hence the name Silicon Valley for California's high-tech region. Now, the reason that purity is so important is that processor technology has continued to advance. The tiny transistors on CPUs have gotten smaller and smaller so that more of them can fit onto one processor die, making it more powerful. And because chip makers are now packing as many of these transistors as possible into CPUs, margin for error is extremely slim, making precise manufacturing and ultra-clean environments absolute must. So, after the silicon is purified, it's turned into what are called wafers, which resemble mirrors. More than the cracker kind of wafer, that wafer is polished and the photosensitive chemical is applied, kind of like what's used in film. Then, ultraviolet light is shown through a stencil that's shaped exactly like the transistor layout that engineers created for CPUs. Because wafers themselves are usually quite large, the process of shining through the stencil can be repeated many times, fitting hundreds of CPU dyes into one single wafer. After the UV light step is complete, the wafer is washed transistors that only allow current to flow in one direction, which means that they can function as tiny switches or grates that make your CPU able to understand instructions. In fact, the whole reason we use silicon as brace or processes is because its ability to accept these ions that form the foundation of modern transistors. So after transistors are created, the next step is to connect them together to make a functional processor die. This is done with rigid copper interconnections, essentially tiny wires that are applied on top of transistors, which are transistors with a similar ultraviolet and magic process to what I explained earlier. Exactly how they are connected depends on what CPU architecture engineers are using, whether it's something like the codename Skylake for Intel or the codename Zen for AMD. This is done in many layers to prevent any of these wires from accidentally touching and causing a short circuit or any other kind of defects. The dies are then tested and the good ones are placed into the CPU package and is what allows it to plug it into the socket on your motherboard. You add a heat spreader on top of that and voila, you've got yourself the beating heart of your new PC, phone or anything else that requires a CPU. But is silicon always going to be the core ingredient in the buffet of CPU's life? Well, because of the properties of silicon, the actual answer is no. We are very close to the physical limits of how small transistors are made on silicon. Meaning that we may see silicons being made out of completely different materials by the end of this decade. But silicon will remain very useful for quite some time. And besides renaming the bay, Ilium Gallium Valley just doesn't roll off the tongue, does it? But you know what rolls off the tongue? Is to hit that like button and also subscribing.